Okay, guys, thank you very much for joining us today live. I really, really do appreciate your presence and your comments already. I see a lot of you have started to join uh, already, so thank you very much for that. Today is a chat that I've been really looking forward to because it's a chat that's going to be very educational for me, and I'm hoping it's going to be educational for a lot of people watching today as well. So it is my great pleasure today to welcome to the show Raj Vedamji. Uh, Vedamji is an en electrical engineer by training, and but he enjoys a range of intellectual pursuits. He's an amateur astronomer with an interest in the history of astronomy. Uh, Vedamji is also a history aficionado and reads voraciously on a range of historical topics with a special interest uh, in, excuse me, with a special interest in Indian astronomy. Raji is a history, sorry. Uh, he, we, we are also going to be talking about the Aryan invasion myth and also about some of the intellectual achievements of ancient Indians and how India can reclaim that scientific and uh, learning temper again. Excuse me, my my internet just cut out there for a little bit, so excuse me for stumbling there. But I'm very excited to invite Raj Vedamji to the show today and very excited to talk to him. So again, uh, please welcome to the show, Raji. Welcome. How are you, Raji? Uh, can you hear me? Oopsie daisy, sounds like my internet might have just given up on me. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Let me know if you can hear me there. Ah, I think uh, I think what might have happened is there might have been a little internet glitch there, and Raji might have cut out so let me see if he can join me again this is always a fun one when there's a nice little glitch right off the beginning that means that the glitches won't happen in the middle of the episode so that's always a good one uh again we already have 36 view as well that's fantastic uh, I, i'm happy that you guys can hear me i'm just going to see if i can invite vedamji back again yeah, yeah. I think what might have happened is that his internet might have cut out. Uh, there were some couple of glitches that were happening on his end. So I can, I'll, let me check if I can invite him again. Yeah, I sent him an invitation. Let's see if I can invite him again. Well, there's a lot of people already watching. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you very much for joining us. This is an interesting one. This is a video that I've been actually waiting for a very long time for uh, to do because uh, a lot of people have been asking me, say, Sham, do a debunking of the iron invasion, do a debunking of the iron invasion theory. And I was going to do a video like that and I might still do a video like that, but excuse me, I really wanted to get uh, Raj Vedamji on because he's such an expert on the matter and hopefully he can uh dispel this theory and just you know present some empirical evidence towards why this theory is just pretty much a concoction so let me let me see what i can do let me see what's happening on that end let me see if i can send him the link again very very interesting let's see What's going on here? Sorry, guys. Uh, I think we're still trying to figure out what really went wrong there. Let me see if I can get him back on. I just sent him the invitation again. All right, who's somebody is asking me a question? Oh, there he is. I apologize deeply. We had a power <laughs> surge over here and knocked my internet and everything out. <laughs> oh, really? I, my computer still not back up. I'm joining uh -oh. by myself. So, oh. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's no worries at all. Uh, I always say that if there are glitches in the beginning of the show, that's the best thing because there are no glitches in the middle and end of the show. So I'd much rather get be done with the glitches in the beginning of the show. So that's Good. that's uh, so that's fantastic. So I was just uh, I I was just introducing you to uh, the audience, Raji, and uh, I just wanted to say that uh, thank you for coming on the show and welcome. 
My pleasure. Thank you. Namaste to everybody. Once again, apologies for my delayed entry into the show. <laughs> no, no worries at all. Um, so, you know, I was thinking we could sort of start from uh, one of the things that has become so prevalent in India, where they've realized that there's been, for the past few decades, there's been a bit of an identity crisis among, you know, a large section of the Indians, because we've been told all sorts of different stories uh, and, and different narratives when it comes to what the story of Indian civilization is, what the story of the Indian people is. And that has led to this uh, identity crisis, so to say. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time on talking about one of the most contentious issues when it comes to that in, uh, you know, identity crisis and one of the real birthers of that identity crisis, which is this, uh, this myth of the Aryan invasion or this myth of this Aryan migration that happened into India, where apparently, uh, you know, a bunch of uncultured horsemen rode into India and overnight created a flourishing, very well uh, read civilization. So I wanted to start a little bit with that. And uh, I, I wanted to start with how you would like to approach it and where from where you would like to approach it. So let's start with it from sort of the history and let's come to today. So let's start with the history a little bit. Outstanding, outstanding. So, so you're absolutely right, uh, Shambhavji, in terms, of, uh, in terms of the narrative that has been thrust upon us. So I often look at this and see the role of the early colonialist in bringing about narrative. One should find it strange that we have got thousands of writers in the Indian context, writers from, you can imagine, start wherever you want. If you want Yajna Valkya, if you want Veda Vyasa, if you want Valmiki, if you want Aryabhata, uh, Brabaskara, all of our classical, medieval, and even recent writers, not one person talks about Aryan invasion. Not one person talks about the Aryan identity or the yes. Dravidian identity. So here we are as insiders watching this bizarre situation where thousands upon thousands of Indic writers writing about themselves <laughs> neither talk about Aryan or Dravidian. The one person who did talk about Dravidian in a tangential way was Adi Shankara, where he referred to himself as Dravida Shishu. And Dravida was used in the context of where the three oceans meet, I am the person right. from the part of uh, this place where this meets, not as an identity, but as a regional marker. So we had this bizarre situation where, um, where, where not one Indic person talks about anything to do with Aryans, anything to do with Dravidians. However, when the colonialists came, all of a sudden you have a situation where uh, there's a new narrative thrust upon us. And all this came about when William Jones, one of the first persons who uh, studied this whole thing, he came to India in the 1700s. And he was a scholar of uh, Latin, Greek, and he learned uh, Sanskrit. And to his amazement, he found that the, the three languages are related, Latin, Sanskrit, and Greek. And he asked, how can this be? Right. So he came about with this idea that perhaps at some point in the remote past, these three uh, languages were, are related because they were common people. And this common right. people, he introduced a construct of Aryans. So pretty soon in colonial uh, Indology came about this idea that people from Central Asia populated uh, India as well as Europe because, you know, they kind of explained where are the Greeks, who are the Greeks and who are the Western. <laughs> so it came about to describe them in that context. And as a, a side to that, they started saying that these people also entered India. So this is the roots, the genesis of this problem, if you will. And over the years, this has been layered. Initially, the first people who studied this problem were people who were linguists, linguists like uh, William Jones and others who were looking at the linguistic category. Then anthropologists such as Risley, they jumped in. Now, anthropology is a bit of a discredited race science. So he came in and he started saying that the width of the nose and the length of the nose can be right. used in a mathematical metric using which can classify the races of humans. Right. And applied it in Scandinavian countries and European countries and tried to see various races there. The Nordic obviously was a standard. Right. <laughs> Came to India and he found a whole uh, a host of races also over here. So this person also uh, was a census commissioner in India, in British India, 1900s or so. 
so he he took the jati varna system classification and subverted it into something called caste that he referred to as caste and so uh, not only was he one of the persons who talked about uh, <laughs> the metrics of the nose uh, cranial capacity <laughs> cranial uh, measurements and things like that to talk about race he also saw us as various caste and he right. entered So that is it. If we have been burdened ever since William Jones, Risley, and people like Robert Caldwell, who were missionaries, so the the powerhouses were the colonial colonial people who wanted to rule the country, and the missionaries who wanted to convert the country. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously the Westerner who wanted to ask his side, okay, who is he as a person? So these three things have joined together. So the scientist, the the social person, the social uh, uh, researcher. and the missionary have joined together and made this narrative the missionary went to robert kelly mm-hmm. robert kelly who came in and looked at tamil nadu and uh, he wanted to convert the population and one way to do that was obviously introduce a division he saw the southern indians as a so called dravidians right distinct from the northerners and uh, then he began his ministry the division and many people have internalized this idea and till today you find uh, people who so strongly hold on to the spurious identity of uh, dravidian right. and not acharya dravidian identity is more uh, vigorously held <laughs> you don't yeah, it's, it. it's it's an interesting one because you don't see a lot of uh, north indians walking around saying we are aryans or you know we are proud aryans or something like that you don't you don't see that a lot but you see that you know dravidian ident- uh, identity and then you have these movements that connect this dravidian <laughs> identity to this african american identity and like there's it's it's and it's, i think it's because of that whole race science aspect of it right where right. dravidians are apparently supposed to be this different race that were yeah. oppressed by the evil aryans just like the african americans were oppressed by the you know uh, the slave traders and and so on and so forth and i think the aryan invasion theory uh, at least a part of it also has to do with how you know when the christian missionaries maybe came to came to india to proselytize people and they saw that okay there are uh, there, there there's evidence here that this civilization existed possibly before the universe was apparently even created so how is that possible so we need to do something where we can fit india into this area where it is cre- it india came into being after the universe was con- uh, you know conceived and not before you're absolutely right so uh, so into this whole issue where the people after william jones tried to study the chronology of india they needed to write a history of india and the chronology of india and to their astonishment they found that many of these things were going back the claims at least in some of the like purana for example the chronological account of kingless and puranas going back to the time of pariksit basically the grandson of the pandavas from that period on there's an unbroken king list going all the way to the Gup- gupta empire and so they couldn't make sense out of it how is it possible that here are a people whose history is going back to even before the so called noah's flood event right so they they were, they were people who came from a time when in england the a particular bishop over there of the anglican church he put together the chronology from the old testament who begat whom and who begat whom and all of this kind of things and started up adding the biblical chronology genealogy from adam all the way downwards and he came to the conclusion that god created the world at 4004 bce sometime <laughs> after that, i don't know the exact date but uh, that that's very said further god destroyed the world approximately 3000 bc no as flood so nothing could have survived that flood event so these guys are astonished So like I said in my earlier talks they took it upon themselves to correct the so called chronological problems in the Indian calendar so they went about cherry picking and um, the, 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 their their fortuitous moment came when they tried to see the synchrony between the so called sandrakutas and chandragupta maurya so in the greek accounts they had an account that there was contact with the king called sandrakutas and so the phonetic equivalent they said this chandragupta maurya whereas from the indic context it was clear that the chandragupta maurya they're talking about is perhaps to be dated about 1200 years prior to that event yes but the maurya event this is a different chandragupta maurya they're talking about anyway the the synchrony that they did over there said the give the aha moment now from a world history that they know in the greek world and other things 
along with the Indian world as an anchor point. They've anchored Santa Cruz to Chandragupta Maurya. Having done that, they worked backward and said, Buddha, approximately 500 BCE, and they progressively moved the downwards to 2 or 400, 300, and so on. And now, once again, shot back ever since they found the Buddhist temple in Lubini, archaeological right. uh, remains is 525 BCE. It's not possible that Buddha was born after that. <laughs> right. <laughs> things, things are in a flux over there. But the bottom line is the chronology was distorted. The chronology was distorted by the same colonialists who uh, uh, tried to make sense out of Indian chronology by force-fitting it into their worldview, which unfortunately today has been layered upon by so many people. So once uh, William Jones started this chronology, then came along the link the relationship of Sanskrit to other European languages. Then came the anthropologists who started with their own race science and all of those things. Things started getting layered upon, upon layered upon. And right now, we are in a situation where the Western uh, society has built up an enormous edifice against which we had to battle as contrary and researchers. We need to go and say, no, this can't be true. But you know, the issue is that when you try to battle one point, there are so many other intertwined uh, points that we need to battle for. Difficult battle, but we need to uh, uh, look at it from various angles. And so today, luckily, we've got tools like genetics. We are once again examining uh, archaeoastronomy, some of the data points that are examined in the past. Once again, bringing it to the fore and saying that we need to take uh, uh, account of all of these things. Archaeology in our country is now matured to a point where uh, some of the dates that are being contemplated are no longer wishful thinking, but yeah. you have artifacts on the ground that tell you that uh, uh, things are ancient enough. So, bottom line, new lines of evidence are coming in to challenge the old narrative. So maybe let's let's touch up touch on a couple of those maybe lines of evidence. So let's look at let's say uh, in, in your talks you were talking about some of the archaeogenetic evidence that was coming through, and you mentioned one of the studies that I found very very interesting, uh, and I think that was the Oppenheimer study that uh, that was calculated that calculated or that estimated that there was a movement that came when people migrated first out of Africa that they migrated through India and then outwards into Europe rather than the other way around. So oh. maybe let's talk about, let's start with some of the archaeogenetics and then maybe move on to some of the archaeological and then we can uh, sort of move into astronomy from there. True, true, true. So, so, so uh, I think we need to uh, place things in perspective uh, before yes. we go deep into this. So human migrations has been the subject of study of a lot of people for a lot of time. So the question is, when you start talking about the humans, who are you talking about? We have several species over here. Right. We have got, uh, the Homo sapiens, we have got the Neanderthals, we have got the Homo erectus, and uh, so many other species. And who is it that we're talking about? Now, we have got proof that in India, the Homo erectus has been existing for maybe more than 2 million years. Wow. We have artifacts in Narmada Valley, in uh, Son Valley, B.S. Valley, and many other places we got artifacts from Homo erectus going back to 500,000 years ago, going back to 300,000 years ago. Even recently, there was a find in Tamil Nadu, which came to around 300,000 uh, years ago, and there was some head scratching on, is this species Homo erectus or is this Homo sapien? So I find the division to be a little artificial. Who says that here is a distinction from Homo erectus to Homo sapien. What are the distinctive characteristics that go from one to the other? Now, there are paleontologists and um, others have got some very well-defined scientific measures that say that if the cranial capacity is so much, if the thigh bone looks like this and bear this way, they're walking upright. You know, there are several um, uh, ideas which have been brought about into science that say this is the distinction from one species to the other. So when we talk about human migrations, we should keep this in mind, right. that what are we really talking about? So we are talking here about Homo sapien now. Now the Homo sapien uh, uh, migratory research, genetic migratory research <laughs> using the maternal mitochondrial DNA has shown that they came out of Africa, somewhere near Kenya perhaps, or Tanzania, in those areas. And uh, the early Homo sapien left um, Africa in two waves. One wave approximately 140,000 years ago crossed the Levant and went towards Europe, but that branch died out because of ice ages and other things. There's no trace of them in the genetic record after that. 
The next crossing was approximately 85,000 years ago, where they crossed over the Red Sea, and there were beach huggers, basically hugged the beach coastline, and uh, through uh, Oman, through Iran, through um, uh, Sindh, Gujarat, triangular part of India, all the way into Sumatra, into Taiwan, all those kind of areas. This migration was in the period from 85,000 years or so, uh, so on. So this was based upon looking at the maternal mitochondrial DNA. Stephen Oppenheimer has provided a lot of archaeological evidence also to show that there are artifacts, like for example, they found areas where they excavated human um, settlements where they were eating shellfish. The fact wow. that they were eating shellfish is an indicator they were beach huggers. They were not yeah. going into the interior and hug, you know, hunting big animals and eating them. They were uh, hugging the beach. And the question comes, why did they do that? They probably did that because they didn't want to confront the Neanderthals in Iran. They did not want to confront the huge animals, perhaps in India, wild animals. India probably had a lot of tiger, probably had a lot of wild elephants, other things. And perhaps the early human did not have the technology to stave them off. Right. So to uh, hide and move on. So there are some ideas, but these are speculative, speculative ideas. But they come and uh, we try to construct the story. So from 85,000 years on, we go to the Mount Toba event. The Mount Toba event was a super volcano in Sumatra, which covered India and Pakistan with about six meters of ash. Once that happened, the human species almost got extincted. Right. And it statistically shown that a repopulation of the Earth took place with less than 1,000 breeding individuals. Wow. Can you, just less than 1,000 breeding individuals are supposed to have repopulated the non-African population of the world. That's incredible. So, incredible. And then the, there is this researcher called Ravi Korisetar who has been working in Jwalapuram in Andhra Pradesh. So his excavations are focused on this layer, precisely this layer where he's gone and found the ash layer. And under the ash layer, he's found human artifacts, like all the tools that they used. And then there is this ash layer, no uh, sign of humans. Again, then there's a resettlement of India. And the, again, artifacts above the ash layer. Fascinating, fascinating work, because this kind of work shows that there were humans existing before the event and right. there's a population after the event. Wow. So now, 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 now we know, uh, correlating with uh, you know, paleoclimatology and other such things, that when the Ice Ages ended in Europe, approximately 60,000 years or so, it coincided with the dying out of the Neanderthals and the Homo sapien filled in that vacuum. They crossed from Sindh, uh, Gujarat, that area. They migrated outwards towards the Bosphorus and they went on and became the future Europeans. Yes. At, at the same time, uh, Indians from this part of India, from the eastern part of India and from Sumeria part of the world, they migrated northwards into Siberia and crossed the then land bridge and became the Native Americans. So oh, wow. Very, very fascinating that if you can call it our recent Homo sapien history, recent meaning 80,000 years ago, <laughs> it shows from the maternal mitochondrial DNA that is a very strong story. We are out of Africa. Again, keep in mind that we are not talking about Homo erectus. Yes. We had it home in India going back to 2 million years or so. That's that's incredible as well. And there's there's so much, uh, you know, you, you were talking about the archaeological evidence that exists as well, where this narrative has been created, okay, that there was this, the Davidians that existed in the Indus Valley civilization and the Aryans came, or, or before the Indus Valley civilization, Aryans came and then pushed them towards the south and then created the Indus Valley civilization, so to say. But then there's so much archaeological evidence that exists in southern India of of you know of existence of a fully functioning um, culture civilization and one of the most interesting things that you were talking about was the i think it was the example of uh, kiriri if i'm pronouncing it correctly yeah. uh, and uh, so so talk to, uh, maybe let's 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 talk a little bit about the archaeological evidence that debunks this theory as well Sure, 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 sure. So, so now we we gotta come to more recent times. So people have been talking. Okay, all of this is about eighty thousand years, sixty thousand years. What about recent times? The Aryans are supposed to have come to India around uh, 1500 BCE yep. Yep. and uh, uh, occupied the plains of northern India and around 500 BCE, chased all the original inhabitants to the south. The Tragedians came to the record in 500 BCE. This is the common narrative that many people have internalized. And even today, the hardcore Dravidians from Tamil Nadu who talk about uh, identities like this. Yes. So, 
our interest is to see is there any support for this in genetics as well as in archaeology. So you open the question of archaeology. So let's look at archaeology. In northern India, we have seen Drakigari, Birana, and other places where settlements have gone up to about 9,500 years before present, approximately wow. 3,000 BCE, let us say. They found artifacts over there. Who are these guys? Right. Whether, the, whether the precursors or the so-called Harappans, or who are these guys? So question is, there is some data point over here that does not add up. So let's put that on one side. Then all along the uh, old the paleo channels of Saraswati, as well as the, the Ganga and other things, we have found settlements. And these settlements are very ancient, going back 5000 BCE, 6000 BCE, and so on, opening up the question once again. If, if there were such widespread settlements all over India, does it make sense to say that here these people are all Harappans and uh, new races come in? So it again opens up a second data point. Now, People have said the lack of archaeological artifacts in southern India shows to us that people first settled the north and then came from north into the south, and that's how they So if we find anything in the south that is earlier than 500 BCE, we have an aha moment that's saying that what is this? So uh, I believe there have been very many archaeological artifacts found in the south for example, the uh, Edical Caves, the uh, uh, Arika Meda, uh, as well as in uh, burials, uh, urn burials all over Tamil Nadu going back to 100,000 years ago, uh, 150 wow. years ago. Very ancient artifacts have been found in Tamil Nadu. There's no doubt about that. Then if you go looking for megaliths, dolmens, and other such things, Tamil Nadu, sorry, uh, whole of southern India is filled with it, whether it is uh, Kerala, whether it is uh, Karnataka, Andhra, or Tamil Nadu. You have artifacts that show uh, huge constructions. Constructions, for example, there's a Stone Age construction. We are lucky to brush them away saying that the Stone Age is not civilization. Right. Point, why would people whose preoccupation is survival, you know, hunting, gathering, and survival come together and, you know, chop off a huge slab of granite, huge, tons, tons of it, lift it up and make pillars and dolmens out of these things and megaliths out of this? What right. is it? There's got to be some social organization. There's got to be some primitive religion, if you will. Uh, the word primitive is used in the lightest sense of the word. Yes, but the yes. Point is that, that, that there's got to be some social organization for people to come together and do something. We don't admit these things in our narrative. Rather, we look for evidence of roads and civilization and so on. All right, even there, Kiradi. Kiradi burst into the news some time back saying that this archaeologist had found uh, some miles away from Madurai, he had found this artifact, this uh, remnants of an ancient city. And uh, they, they took some uh, st uh, stratum of uh, uh, ground from uh, Kiradi and sent it off to Florida for carbon dating. So these guys came and said that it's probably dated to around uh, 300 BC or so. On. So uh, this fits very well into the common narrative. The common narrative saying that any artifact in southern India should be 500 BC and later. That's when the Dravidians appeared in the record. However, I asked the question that you dug in Kiradi up to 4.5 meters. You took artifacts in the middle layer somewhere in the middle layer, and set it down. That was dated to around 300 BC. So if you do a linear, a linear mapping, linear scale, if the top layer is 2018, and the middle layer corresponds to 2,000 years ago in two meters, that means every meter approximately is about 1,000 years. Yeah. I don't have my math in my head immediately. Just an example, 1,000 years, right. linear dating. Now, people can contest that. They can say that doesn't make sense, doesn't make sense. But then the point is, if you don't have anything else to go by, we as scientists need to make use of the metrics that we can start with. It could be a linear metric, maybe nonlinear, it's better. But the point is, I don't have that nonlinear metric yet. So let's start with a linear metric and then take it from there and refine it with future measurements, make it better. That's the methodology we follow. So if we take the linear methodology saying that from top layer to middle layer is 2,000 years, then middle to 4.5 uh, meters depth goes beyond 3,000 BCE. Wow. Beyond 3000 BC, even the question comes, wait a minute, are we talking about an urban settlement in southern India in 3000 BC? Whoa! <laughs> yeah, who are these people? You know, where were these? They suddenly dropped from the sky. What happened? Exactly. exactly. Uh, so, so people would say that, you know, 
people use the middle layer because that's where carbon artifacts are found. If you're doing carbon dating, obviously we need carbon artifacts, so C14 dating. You know, it's got to say how much of radioactive content is there. So you need something like either remains of food or food grains or, or agricultural material or any carbon-based life form material that is there can be done. So there was some noises saying that in that layer at 4.5 meters, they did not find uh, uh, carbon material. Right. That is not an excuse. That is not an excuse. You know, because I did not find a layer there, I'll stop with where I found it and say that is a day. Well, that's exceedingly cautious. Exceedingly cautious to say that I, this, I'm dating this 300 BCE because you're leaving a huge story untold. I right. think you have to uh, be uh, more um, embracive and say that we found a range of artifacts. We found a range of artifacts from 300 BCE, perhaps going all the way to 3000 BCE. You know, but the problem is that we have politicized these things so much in our country that uh, uh, people can't come out and say the things they want to say because this identity issue is something that uh, people don't have a grasp on. The scientists don't have a grasp on it. The government doesn't have a grasp on it. Politicians don't have a grasp on it. Academicians don't have a grasp on it. Missionaries love to have a, for a difficult, different kind of narrative. Right. In. Too many power brokers here. Too many power brokers it, and too much. It's, it's such a strange thing because it's like it's almost like saying that okay, now humans are going to go to the moon and we're going to explore the moon, but we're not going to explore any further because we we don't know what we might find. It's almost like saying that. It's like saying, oh, we know the moon, we understand the moon, but we don't need to understand anything further because we don't know what we might find. I, I love the analogy of the guy who loses his ring under somewhere um, in the dark, but he searches under the light because there's yeah. light he's searching there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's incredible. <laughs> and, and also with the... I, I wonder if you're privy to some information with that, but when it comes to people in southern India, is this information that you're talking about, is this information something that people are realizing or is this information that people are privy to? And if they are privy to, how does it affect their whole identity-based worldview that, okay, well, according to what I've been told by all these people, my you know, I was forced down from the from the mountains in the north down here. But it turns out that I it, it's possible that I may have been here for much longer than what the missionaries have told me. Uh, you know, you know, to answer that question, we got to first realize that southern India is not a monolith. Yes, are, yes. A lot of different people there, a lot of different ideas and other such things. This whole thing is a non-issue for people, I would venture to say, in Kerala, Karnataka, Andhra, Telangana, it's not an issue at all. Nobody even brings up the identity issue. Nobody sees this as a problem at all. Even in Kerala? Even in Kerala, even in Kerala. The problem is Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu has been subjected to pervasive, um, uh, what's the kindest word I can use for it? Education. <laughs> <laughs> that is very kind indeed. Pervasive education from the time of Robert Caldwell going on to the time of the Justice Party and uh, going forward in time. They've been subjected to a certain kind of narrative repeatedly, one that emphasizes that the reason for your poverty, the reason for your backwardness, the reason why you're here is because this very small percentage of population who came from northern India, by the way, they were the Aryans, they came and they subjected their will on us and relegated us to this position. The common man does not want to deconstruct that statement and see the validity to see is poverty in southern India, or rather in Tamil Nadu, a consequence of some uh, uh, less than one percenter of the society who has no military power or anything, or even money power, it's only the brain power, comes in over there that he's going to control. Does that narrative even hold? It simply doesn't hold. There's neither military force apply, neither is there money force apply. So how would a one percenter come and rule everything? So that's the first question that uh, people need to scratch their head and uh, worry about. Secondly, I think uh, to answer your question, um, this is primarily an issue in Tamil Nadu. Tamil Nadu needs to reconcile with this aspect that what did Caldwell come there for? What was the impact of Caldwell's um, teachings on Justice Party? What did the Justice Party founders, what did they intend to do? How did that ideology evolve into a political ideology? And they got to see the spuriousness of that narrator coming from uh, the language itself, the linguistics of the language, going into uh, genetics, going to archaeology, going to commonality with the rest of India, 
they have to see how pervasive the common culture of India is in Tamil Nadu. And right. it comes from themselves. For example, um, uh, Dr. Nagaswamy, who was a retired ASI uh, uh, general from Tamil Nadu, he himself has written a book, Tamil Nadu, Land of the Vedas, and looked at evidence mm-hmm. from uh, uh, epigraphy. He's looked at evidence from works, Tamil works, going back to Sangamira. And he's tried to talk about uh, how there's no difference between the culture of Tamil Nadu and the rest of India. It's one big spurious narrative that has been imposed upon Tamilians. If they don't want to believe Nagaswamy, they could go and look at David Shulman. David Shulman is a professor from Israel. So this gentleman who studied Tamil has written a book called Tamil, the biography. I have it in my shelf somewhere. I can't see it. Uh, Tamil, a biography. So this book, he echoes a a lot of what uh, Dr. Nagaswamy says. He says that I cannot find any evidence of uh, alien influence in Tamil Nadu because it seems to be a common substrate that runs throughout the country. Right. These are powerful words, but then the common person in Tamil Nadu who's swayed by political arguments and other such things needs to reevaluate some of these things. Um, so I want to I want to move on to uh, astronomy soon, but I want to just take one question that I've been getting from uh, the audience a little bit, and they're asking that. Uh, uh, you know, if 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 we come from the same stock, if we're if we're very, so similar in our culture, then what explains the difference between, say, the Indo-European languages and the languages that are considered to be Dravidian languages? What explains the linguistic difference? What explains the script difference in in those languages? Okay, so there are many 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 ideas that you you said in that one sentence. So yeah. there are long discussions. You talked about script. You talked about language, commonality, and so on. So uh, uh, nobody has a definitive answer. Let me start out over there. There are a lot of opinions over there. Lots of opinions, strong opinions from some people. However, one needs to uh, deco deconstruct each of this with the available evidence and continually research to see what can say further. That said. Uh, if we look at the uh, Tamil language and the Sanskrit, Sanskrit, whether it's Nagaswamy or Shulman or uh, anybody else who has studied this sufficiently deep, they find evidence of contact between these two languages at a remote antiquity. There's borrowings of words from this language to that, that language to this, the idioms used are similar, the, the, the ideas expressed are similar. So, Nobody knows. But then the point is that there is evidence of these languages having been side by side for an exceedingly long period of time. How long can it be? That's the next question that we need to ask. If you look at genetics, in genetics in 2013, there was this paper from um, CCMB, excuse me, CCMB in Hyderabad. So they came and said that, uh, let's look at who are the Indians in the context of Two ancient populations, ancient populations that they speculated were uh, the ancestral North Indian and ancestral South Indian. Now, this is the way genetics works. If you find some ancient specimens that you have, ancient specimens means DNA material, right? You might get it from some skeletons, you might get it uh, at some periods of time and so on. So if you have specimens, ancestral North Indian, ancestral South Indian, you go out there and take the current day population and you take that uh, genetic uh, um, uh, profiles. And then you try to study how many of something called alleles in the ancient population are present in the current population, how much of uh, frequency of something else present in the ancient population. You set up an optimization problem, an admixture kind of problem that tries to study how are the ancient populations and current populations related. So these guys came about with a very interesting conclusion. They said the ancestral north and ancestral south existed side by side for an exceedingly long period of time without mixing. And how long? From 60,000 years ago after Mount Toba until perhaps about 5,000 years ago, 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, they existed side by side without mixing. Then they saw that something happened around 2000 BCE that caused enormous mixing of the Indian population, the northern Indians, so not topical mixing, not things like, you know, at uh, Andhra or uh, Madhya Pradesh border, a couple of guys married. Yeah. No. Always, uh, very wow. pervasive mixing of the population happened. And this seems to have taken place over a period of 2000 years. Then they said, for the last 2,000 years, we have been endogamous. Endogamous meaning that not marrying uh, outsiders, but within communities. 
So if we take this genetic data point and place it side by side with what we were saying, there seems to be some genetic support also to the idea that Tamil and Sanskrit could have coexisted side by side, evolved for an exceedingly long period of time, borrowing from each other, and then eventually growing. So uh, admittedly, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of voices over here. So no one voice is going to uh, prevail over the other. The next thing is about scripts. How did the scripts evolve? That's an entirely different story because there is still so much of noises about how Brahmi is uh, related to uh, uh, Karoshti and uh, other languages because it's an attempt to try and show that scripts came from, um, uh, from, from you know, the, 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 the the Semitic scripts. Right. Semitic scripts are the ones that influence the Indic scripts. There's an attempt to show things like that without proof. There's not much proof. If yeah. you look at the content, it shows very well about um, uh, uh, the Puranic accounts of how script came into India itself. So the so point, point is that the Brahmi script has been found in Tamil Nadu, Tamil Brahmi script. It has been found in Ashokan scripts. It has been found uh, in various places going back to 400 BCE, 300 BCE, 200 BCE. They got uh, 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 artifacts over there. That's an entirely different story over there. And it's interesting as well, right? So, sorry, uh, but it's interesting as well, right? Where people make the case that uh, the, uh, the these evil Aryans came in on their on horseback and then they introduced the caste system into India. But when you look what you were just talking about, about the endogamy that existed, at least uh, for 2000 years recently. And even before that, there was this form of endogamy that existed. And people say uh, that, the, you know, so there's this aspect of well, the Westerns call it caste, but, you know, this just jati system and some form of endogamy that existed a lot before the Aryans supposedly even entered India. Very, very true. Very true. In fact, in one of my talks, Excuse me, I give a data point of a professor who from uh, southern uh, Tamil Nadu, R Ramaswamy Pichapan, he, he took some samples of uh, various caste, community, tribes, uh, so-called caste, tri community, tribes, and other things in southern India, in Tamil Nadu spe specifically, maybe about 1,600, 1,700 samples. And he tried to address the question about some of these things over there. And he came to the conclusion that endogamy was practiced in southern India going back at least 6,000 6, years. So endogamy is in practice in the South at least 6,000 years. It's not a consequence of Aryans coming and imposing a so-called caste system on the South and Im imposing endogamy. He shows it has already existed over there. So many of these constructs that people are using are questionable. There are counter data for every one of these things. And uh, we as scientists need to evaluate these things very, very carefully. Take the data points and uh, see what are they implying. Very true. So I, let's let's move towards a little bit of an area that I think uh, uh, you have a great interest in, and I have an interest in as well. And it's about you know Indian astronomy and gen Indian sort of scientific achievements in general. And this is this is a very controversial area for some strange reason because you know you have you have people that have grown up in sort of the British system of education that say, well, uh, you know whatever. Uh, in you know scientific accomplishments that Indi uh, that Indians have are actually not Indian accomplishments, and they're you know these are just these uh, sort of bucks or these Indian nationalists trying to ascribe uh, accomplishments where there are none. So 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 maybe let, let's let's talk about astronomy. Let's maybe start with uh, Indian astronomy, and I want to also move uh, towards the end of our discussion towards how this uh, information actually moved to the Islamic world and then move to Europe through the Islamic world. So maybe the Western world thinks that these are uh, Islamic inventions. But let's maybe start with uh, the, the Indian astronomy. And uh, uh, how do you want to go about it? OK, OK, so very interesting. So uh, the, the roots of Indian astronomy, or perhaps I could even speculate to say the world astronomy itself, because there's some evidence that Indian astronomy seeded knowledge in, uh, uh, in other parts of the world too. The Indian astronomical model was one of nakshatras and Rashi. So ancient Indians at a very ancient period of time, they observed that every day the moon appears on the east at a different time and against a different backdrop of the stars. Okay, you have the stars, uh, some fixed stars out there, but the moon appears to rise at a different time against a different backdrop of the stars. So they said, let's look at the phases of the moon they deciphered this 27 uh, days over there, 
from 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 full moon to full moon and those kind of things and they said let's divide the sky such that uh, uh, we can see where the moon is traversing in which section of the sky so this division uh, turns out to be the nakshatras so they divided the sky in 13 and 1/3 degree segments and they found that the first segment they said let's look for the principal brightest star in that segment of the sky and based upon that uh, segment of the uh, star in that segment of the sky we call it that nakshatra name so by evolving mnemonics they were able to recognize a star and identify it by its name and typically the name the mnemonic is uh, uh, it's tied so deeply into the philosophy of the land so they evolved the story of moon marrying the 27 daughters of king daksha ah oh. so the moon chandra he married the 27 daughters of king daksha and these 27 nakshatras are given the names of the daughters so there are delightful stories on each nakshatra that help the common indian to quickly say, take that story and identify an astronomical phenomenon associated with it so you see learning in the country was deeply tied with the ethos of the land with the thinking of the land with the ideas the pervasive ideas of the land so that you know it is not a, a very dry thing saying that you will find the star spica or chitra at so many degrees in the sky so many light ascension very very dry rather there is a delightful story that says where will you find chitra what is the story behind chitra why is dhruva immobile in the sky all these kinds of things you know so there are there are uh, uh, astronomical stories in puranas uh-huh. that help us to identify the stars in the sky identify the nakshatras and therefore mark the passage of time wow. which is the the critical need for indians were to mark the passage of time what is the muhurta for a certain entity they want to do what is the tithi so one idea leads to the other so we can see that there are ideas that talked about nakshatras the ideas are talked about characteristics of nakshatras from there it goes on to uh, certain ideas of uh, what is a good time to start an activity for example for example the whole of the nakshatra model was pegged to the time of when would you plow the field when would you put a certain seed in it and when would you start uh, harvesting so these are also tied to the nakshatra model just like today in the west you have the old farmers almanac that tells yep. you uh, you know old old wife stories on when the sun is here do this do that and those kind of things but i'm not equating it to that we have a powerful right. mechanic which is based on science that tells you that when the moon is in this particular nakshatra full moon appears in this particular nakshatra it's time for you to start harvesting because they know the monsoon is going to come there they know that's when you do certain things so some auspicious times are built into certain activities for best uh, results and so you can see an evolution of ideas starting from there into the rest of uh, indian context but the bottom line is there was a great need for precise measuring of time whether it is tithi muhurta uh, or other things there was a need for precise measuring of time that led to the intellectual activity of trying to say how does the moon traverse in the sky how do the planets traverse in the sky against the fixed stars so that intellectual activity led to a great many discoveries led to great many discoveries so people have written so many books out there so the earliest that uh, we have been able to see on the nakshatra model is the vedanga jyotisha vedanga jyotisha there are people who dated 1400 bce saying that uh, that mentions certain astronomical phenomena that can be dated to this time frame so that's where it is but there is some evidence that is even more ancient than that surya siddhanta has another text that talks about these things but is in uh, so when when there's these uh, measurements of time you know there's this measurement of when they say kal and you have these massive numbers for you know this kal and uh, this yug and kali yug and treta yug and stuff like that is is there any actual basis to that or do you, is people you know a lot of people say that oh these are just arbitrary numbers and flights of fancy and uh, you know how can one how can you know that one uh, yug exists of this many years how do you even measure it and how people haven't been around for that long is there a sign some sort of a empirical basis to how they came up with the actual number of years for each yug is that something related to astronomy well um, uh, I, and the, the short answer is i don't know but okay. the long answer is there are a lot of things over here a lot of things over here first is the four is two is three is to one cycle so the yugas follow that kind of a pattern yes. so depending on number of kali yuga multiplied by 2 multiplied by 3 4 you get the four yuga system that way the next thing is the duration of the yugas itself 
there are some people who come and say the yoga system does not find mention in the vedas so they find their way in the siddhanta period of uh, indian astronomy uh, meaning that aryabhata and varaha mihira and baskara these are the guys who talk about this and the reason they talked about these where they wanted to say how many revolutions of sun since kali yuga for example that would be a huge number and these huge numbers help them deal with precision because the decimal point precision the kind of arithmetic that they did if they wanted to do an in integer uh, uh, notations they would take the number of days that have elapsed since a certain period of time so we can take for example some of the aryabhata's works from aryabhatiya and we can very clearly take um, uh, uh, his numbers and figure out what are the number uh, the exact duration of the solar year that falls out of his integer numbers over there out of his integer numbers two of them you take it divide it you get uh, 365.24 etc etc in terms of the solar year so the bottom line is some of these big numbers there is some evidence in siddhantic period it was used for um, precision the question is is the allegation that people throw at it correct that you guys don't find a mention in vedas we know that ramayana and others talk about rama in a certain period of time they talk about uh, mahabharata talks about uh, yuga sir with a certain period of time so the question then would be are we falling into the leftist trap that says that ramayana and mahabharata were written in uh, 300 current era in the gupta right. kingdom <laughs> so it's a ridiculous concept or or is the concept of yuga much more ancient than what some people would have us believe and i believe that is the correct answer the yugas are much much older than what people would have us believe i don't have evidence i'm sure there are a lot of knowledgeable people out there who come and say you know yuga finds mention this particular document over there i'm sure there are people over there who can easily come up with that i don't have the evidence but right. i know that ramayana talks about it the mahabharata talks about the yuga period and that i know that there's archaeo astronomical evidence in both of these uh, texts that hint at very great antiquity very great antiquity so the question that we can come about and ask is have the writers uh, future writers imposed the idea of yuga into existing ramayana and mahabharata which is what leftists are very fond of saying yes but then but then the problem is the entire narrative is embedded in these concepts right for, for example about kali yuga for example about dwapara yuga treta yuga all of these things there are some incidents related in puranas incidents related in these uh, itihasas that uh, are critical to some of the when the uh, yuga goes from one to the other so i find that very far fetched there's an allegation on the table but there does not appear to be data to corroborate that to corroborate that but then i do see a lot of evidence stacked up in the index side where there is tremendous uh, instances of data embedded very neatly into the narrative that they want to say so i have no reason to believe that you guys are a siddhantic um period hmm. mention hmm. i believe they're much more ancient than that yeah and and it's one of the incredible proofs presented to that as well is something that you were talking about in one of your videos and it was about uh how you know the, the different position the the position of the earth uh in accordance to certain stars you know according mm-hmm. to how the i'm 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 completely butchering it the way i explain it but uh the i think it's something related to the way the earth spins and when mm-hmm. you know it's, it's similar to how a top spins and when a top spins really quickly there's a yeah. small wobble that happens mm-hmm. and with that wobble i think the position of the earth shifts in relation to certain stars and yeah. from that and in 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 antiquity when you see older sort of uh, astronomers and uh, people who wrote literature talk about these stars and you see the position of these stars in accordance to the planet now you can sort of get an idea of the time frame of certain periods within indian civilization so again that claim that a lot of the race scientists that a lot of these you know aryan invasion theory proponents make it it's a very good counter it's a very good scientific empirical astronomical counter to those claims as well right absolutely absolutely in fact i go as far as saying this is primary evidence this is primary evidence not merely empirical primary evidence and uh, what we have is in the sky is a celestial clock it's a celestial clock that we can uh, decode to a great degree of accuracy now 
for arguments point we can uh, start saying that accuracy is limited for various factors relativistic factors and uh, i will not go there yes i acknowledge that those are there but let's take a linear uh, assumption right now and in the linear assumption to create accuracy we can uh, decode some of the dates involved over here and like you said the point is the earth in addition to the rotation 24 hour rotation in addition to the revolution around the sun 365.24 days it has got a third degree of motion and that is the wobble that you pointed out the wobble is when the axis of rotation is right now pointing to polaris polaris in houston where i live is around 29 degrees in the sky okay it is it it used to be uh, polaris used to be the latitude star used by sailors in antiquity because they knew the height of polaris in the sky will tell them which latitude they are navigating on so it was a navigator's uh, star basically right so uh, right now we are pointing to polaris approximately not exactly approximately but because of wobble this wobble that the earth's axis where it is pointing to traces a path that is 26500 years it takes a, a, a path of that nature so 15000 years ago we were not pointing at polaris but we were pointing at a star called abijit uh, abijit uh, a star that in greek we call vega we were pointing that was our polar star and today if you look uh, in the night sky if uh, polaris for me is over there abijit comes somewhere over there i don't think you can see where my hands are wow, yeah. point is that uh, uh, is a very wide distance in the sky so when i right. go I can see where Polaris and I can see Vega is, and I sit there and wonder. There was a period of time, and that guy was the North Star, and how would the Earth's nakshatras have appeared at that time? So a lot of uh, interesting thoughts. Point is, point is that at various periods of time, because of this very slow wobble, uh, the nakshatras would occupy certain places where uh, certain um, um, what is the word? I what's the word for it? There were some, there were some uh, cardinal points of astronomy out there. Cardinal points are the solstice and equinox. You know, the solstice is when the sun goes north, 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 and north, and reaches the northernmost point at twenty three point three degrees, and then retracts and goes southernmost point twenty three degrees, right? Minus twenty three point three degrees. So this uh, peregrination of the sun, if you will, because of Earth's tilt, is referred to as uh, Uttarayana, Dakshinayana in our classical text. or we refer to it as solstice dates or we have the summer solstice and the winter solstice and so on when it is navigating from the north to south it crosses the celestial equator the date it crosses the celestial equator is the equinox so you have four cardinal points in astronomy that solstice this solstice and the two equinox points now because of the wobble on the dates of these four cardinal points the nakshatras could be at different places wow so, that's incredible true somebody say that kritika was at the summer solstice at this point it is only valid once for 26000 years wow so within, within a precision of 26000 years you can say when did a certain nakshatra occupy a certain cardinal point in astronomy so all of our texts are filled with these cardinal uh, point measurements so these are our archeo astronomical uh, measurements that we have artifacts if you will so whether you're talking about uh, the brahmanas the upanishads whether you're talking about um, the vedas or the uh, upangas many 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 uh, things over there you have uh, archeo astronomical measurements so these wow. are cardinal points and like you said i can now use a linear projection and say if the precession rate is two nakshatras or sorry uh, in a certain period of time sorry one nakshatra in 960 years that's a rate of precession made when what would have been at what period of time on a linear scale now there are some people who say that precession is non linear there are some periods of time it appears faster and some periods of time it goes slow yeah i agree i agree because of gravitational effects a lot of things come into picture over there but in a linear scale assume that the 360 degrees is doing is uniform and we can come up with several dates that show staggering staggering antiquity for some of the artifacts that have been recounted in my talks i have talked about um, how the mahabharata recounts a time when abhijit was at the pole star and a time it has fallen in the sky 
So that recounting goes uh, implies that somebody has been observing the skies since the last fifteen thousand years. Wow, that is staggering. That's incredible. Also, That's amazing. So to this one more at Kritika, the summer solstice. Kritika, the summer solstice last happened uh, um, twenty three thousand years ago. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> that's just amazing. You know, when you hear something like that, that's just amazing. Uh, and, you know, it's it's very interesting. It's very interesting that there's so much knowledge that exists and there's so much material that exists. But I think there's a couple of reasons why we don't hear about it or why we don't know about it. I think one of the reasons is what I, I think wanted to talk about is sort of knowledge transfer as, as in knowledge that traveled from India to other nations and other kingdoms. And from there it traveled to, let's say Europe. And then since the West became prominent, they believe that this knowledge came from this source rather than actually completing the entire chain. Yeah. And, uh, and so, so I think that's one of the other reasons. And the other reasons is of course the whole, uh, uh, you know, how is it possible that Indians have ever invented anything that yeah. whole narrative? So, so let, let's talk about the first one first, which is the sort of knowledge transfer and the movement of knowledge from India that uh, unfortunately India doesn't get its due when it comes to that kind of knowledge. So where, where does it start? When does the sort of transfer start? Does it start in the Islamic age or does it start before the sort of uh, transfer without uh, citation, so to say? Very, very good question. So... In the last WAVES conference, WAVES 2018 in Dallas, I have a paper on this, and I would urge uh, uh, listeners to please download the paper. It's on knowledge transfers. There's a lot of uh, uh, literature that I've cited with references that uh, people can go and validate some of the things that I'm saying. So I have looked at when knowledge transfers occurred and tried to find evidence for various periods of time. From 2000 BCE onwards, for example, from 2000 BC, not that it does not exist prior to that. It could, but I, I don't have the data to start talking about. From 2000 BC onwards, then to the time before Pythagoras, then Pythagoras time frame, 500 BCE, Alexandrian time frame in 300 BCE, then the medieval period, then the Islamic period, then the colonial period, then the modern period. I split it up into all these periods of time and I've shown Channels for knowledge transfer. It's not enough to say knowledge is transferred. We must also show what was the mechanism for knowledge transfer. How did the knowledge go from one point to another? What is that knowledge that went from one point to another? How do we have evidence that it seeded the corpus of knowledge in that land? So all of these are questions that we must address to form a comprehensive uh, uh, idea. Now, for example, David Pingree is one of the persons who has done a lot of research on mathematics, astronomy of Indians. And his central thesis is that Indian scholars. <laughs> just one question, actually. There's a good question that came from uh, one of the members. Mayavi is asking where to download that paper from that you presented at Waves. Uh, is there is there a link that I can provide in my description where people can download it? Yes, yes. I'll give you the link later. <laughs> if if you can go to my Facebook page, Raj okay. Vedu Facebook okay. page. I have a post on there, perhaps less than a month ago, where I give okay. the download for both papers. I have two papers there. Okay. The link, so please go and uh, download it there. Okay, terrific. So guys, I hope that answers the question. And one more quick thing uh, to the people here is that if you have any questions, please make sure to write them in the top chat right now. Uh, in about 10 or 15 minutes, I'll take a couple of questions for uh, Vedamji from the audience here as well. So write down your questions right now. Uh, I will try and take the super chat questions first, and then I'll uh, try to take a couple of the regular questions as well. So uh, please write it down right now, and I'll make sure to uh, ask Vedamji. Sorry, Vedamji, for interrupting. Please go ahead. No, no problem. So, so if, if people also go to the IHAR channel on YouTube, that is I-H-A-R, stands for Indian History Awareness and Research, an organization that I'm part of. So I've given a talk over there on the antiquity of Indian medical systems. And there's also a paper in Waves that talks about the same antiquity. So in this talk, I've tried to show knowledge transfers from India in the medical field, in the medical area, how Ayurveda influenced the knowledge systems of the Mitannis, the Kassites, the Hittites, the Babylonians, the Egyptians. I've tried to show the links from one to the other. What was the knowledge in Atharva Veda? 
and what is the knowledge that went from here to the other lands so try to show from that period of time just focusing on uh, medicine in this aspect before that introduction is trying to tell you about david pingree a famous professor who passed away unfortunately some time back he did a lot of work on um, indian mathematics indian astronomy but his thesis was to show that indians incorrectly copied this data from the greeks and his point everywhere he wanted to show the babylonians and the greeks were the ones who gave this knowledge to india so they went through enormous efforts to decode some of the cuneiform uh, uh, tablets of uh, babylon uh, later babylon in era and try to see with modern day reconstructions of mathematics and algorithms how could they have computed square root of 2 how could they have computed several other things without apparently having the zero or even sometimes a positional arithmetic well uh, there is a strong statements i'm making there are there are there are some wow. positional evidence of some zero handling some evidence of positional handling in some of these things too point is that they make use of modern reconstructions to construct a story of the past i find the problem there because that is taken out of context and does not pay cognizance to the boundaries of the problem the problem is got to go like i said what is the channel for knowledge transfer who from babylon came and gave that knowledge to india show me the ch- uh, no, channel show me the personalities involved show the text that were involved show the evidence of that knowledge over here if evidence this knowledge that rather if there's an allegation that cuneiform came from babylon to india then we should have that form of writing somewhere in india <laughs> somewhere or, or, or any sort of maybe acknowledgement of that any any ver- even a verbal inscription yeah. something some sort I'm, of acknowledgement i'm being facetious here but i'd love to see the ramayana in cuneiform somewhere <laughs> <laughs> exactly <laughs> you're absolutely right so 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 i i have tried to critique some of these things by uh, layering my theory in in slow steps first i talk about knowledge transfer uh, channels what were the channels for the 2000 bc time frame i'm relying on genetics paleoclimatology and consequent migration as a route because of which or rather a reason for which indians left this part of india and migrated outwards they were probably the mitannis they probably became the uh, other populations over there because there's evidence of the mitanni speaking sanskrit and some of the some of the uh, leftist scholars are very happy to say that yeah that's because syria was a place sanskrit originated <laughs> wow that's amazing so you see there are some very crazy untenable uh, connections that people make without ignoring a host of evidence from this side that shows a preponderance of evidence here and they neglect that and they talk about uh, something from that side anyway uh, i'm diverting the point mitannis sanskritic people evidence of uh, uh, knowledge of uh, ashvinis of um, uh, brahma of indra or about other other uh, vedic deities there is some evidence of ashvinis or the gods of healing i'm talking about medicine right so they talk about ashvinis they talk about uh, healing statue of shautar which they use with the uh, um when 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 the egyptian king the pharaoh uh, when he fell ill imenhotep 2 when he fell ill the mitanni king sent him a healing statue of durga on a lion <laughs> oh really <laughs> yes <laughs> wow that's amazing you you find instances like this you find instances like how um um in 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 the in the hittites they had a cholera outbreak a smallpox outbreak which eventually destroyed the civilization but the point is they found that their deity who's related to varuna varuna god of water right so uh, garuna uh, oh, sorry varuna uh, they they have a story that the god trapped the disease demon in a copper pot wow this we know from the indic side of things that if you store water in a brass or a pot or a copper pot over there yeah, yeah, yeah. it kills some other germs in it so somewhere they found that the disease demon can be trapped in it and you can have clean water to drink so there is like this i have compiled several data points that show echoes of indic thought in a very very ancient period of time when you cannot be expected to find direct evidence nobody's gone written it on a wall somewhere in a chisel in stone saying here is evidence that's not there but if you look for it you'll find it second the kesites the babylonians they were in the place where uh, dilmonis for example dilmonis um, 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 bahrain today's bahrain even today you find evidence of indus valley seals over there 
So from Lothal, they were uh, trading with those people over there. If you look at a map, see where Lothal is, and you see where Dilmun is, you'll know that you can hug the coast and have uh, trading over there. And Lothal was a port. Even today, you go and can see reconstruction of Lothal. It's like a port. So they had trading even in those days. Even Indic knowledge was a route for Babylonians. So Babylonians, Mitannis, um, Egyptians, they have evidence of some ancient plants. So let's put that aside now. Now go to next, uh, uh, um, the Mycenaeans. The Mycenaeans are the precursors of later Greek uh, kingdoms. These people, in their stories, you find enormous overlap with Puranic stories. I am flabbergasted when I look at some of the stories. And I look at the stories of astronomy that they've encoded in their uh, stories. I said, this is an exact copy of a Puranic story. Wow. How, is How is it possible? That's possible if either there was strong contact or maybe Indians themselves had migrated in some Vedic period of time to this area. Mycenaeans, by the way, we're talking around, I don't know, 1800 BCE, 1500 BCE to around uh, maybe 1800 BCE. That's the time frame. It is a Homeric period. The Homeric period, the Odyssey, Iliad, all these things were written in somewhere in the tail end of that civilization. So there is knowledge in Greece about India already. Come to Pythagoras, 500 BCE. He came to India to study. Why did he know that he had to come to India to study if there did not already exist a tradition that the educated Greek gentleman had to go to India to complete his education? So you find Democritus, you find uh, Pythagoras, you find a whole lot of other Greek scholars who had come to places like Ethiopia, come to places like India, who had come to places like Egypt and other places, got the learning and gone back to their lands and continued their education. In their teachings, we find enormous evidence of Vedanta. Wow. The knowledge of Vedanta is there in uh, Pythagoras, his successor Socrates, um, uh, Aristotle, Plato, all, all, all of these people seem to have got same ideas that are encompassing the Vedanta idea of Brahman, oneness, the one, intimius, uh, and other, other such works. You, you, find, you, find, you find these kind of uh, things. So uh, we talked about Pythagoras period. Next, you move over to uh, Alexandrian time frame. Alexander 325 BCE came to the very frontiers of uh, ancient India. Uh, there is evidence of knowledge transfer there. He talked to philosophers, philosophers went back over there, all kinds of things. Even prior to that, he talked about the Buddhist period. The Buddhists, when Buddha left Earth, he gave order to his followers that they must form the Sangha and spread the knowledge throughout the world. So you had Buddhist monks going all right. over, especially in that part of the world. You talk about Gandhara, you talk about the Persian Empire, you talk about the Greece. They were avosh in Buddhist ideas. Avosh. They also, you know, one of the one of the things that really I think uh, interests people or really gets people talking, and one of the things that exists as a such a strong narrative today is they talk about this. You know, the golden age of Islam is when Islam became like this this hub of scientific discovery yeah, and invention. There. Yeah, coming there, Shambhu. Sure, okay, sure, 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 sure. Okay. Long storyteller. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. That's absolutely fine. In, uh, in, in this period of time. So let's move from this period of time. Let's go to the medieval period. Okay. Medieval period, you have a whole host of uh, knowledge transfers over there, starting with, we have got the Periplus of the Eritrean Sea. Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, the port sailors document that shows mm. where the Roman sailors trading with southern Indian ports all over the Kerala coast, Tamil Nadu coast, even up to Andhra coast. Roman sailors would come and trade from there. Then you look, talk of the Silk Route. The Silk Route was a place where even Indic knowledge was, trans uh, was being transmitted. And one example I give is the Bower Manuscript. Bower Manuscript is, contains one of the oldest uh, knowledge of Indian medicine, uh, ex existing manuscript, if you will. So this was found in Kashka. In, uh, it, was in the, it was in the Silk Route, an evidence of how knowledge is there in the Silk Route. You go, whether you're talking about transfers to China, to Japan, to Korea, or to this part of the world, Mediterranean world, is evidence even in the medieval period. You come to times like Anushirwan. You had to talk about world events. Too much to talk about over here. For example, um, um, talk about the Byzantine kingdom, the fall of the Byzantine kingdom. Before, even before that, how the Byzantine kings were persecuting the Nestorians. Nestorians were the guys who denied the, uh, the human form of Christ. They said that Christ is only a divinity in the mind, not a human form. Wow. And for that reason, these guys were persecuted by the Byzantine, who were Christians of that era, right. like, like today's Taliban. So they went, they were killing them off, and there were all kinds of things. These Nestorians fled from there and came to India, because it was already trading between Syria and India from that period of time itself. So these guys became the future Syrian Christians of Kerala. 
Ah. So it came in multiple waves, and one of the earliest waves was this persecution by by these people. They formed a conduit where knowledge still was being transferred to the bishop in Edessa and other such places. So from Kerala coast, knowledge is still going in medieval period into uh, into Europe. Wow. Then come to Islamic period. So uh, Sindh. Well, we know Bin Qasim, 7-11, current era, and so on. This guy comes and uh, conquers the spot. And we have evidence that Brahmins took several works from uh, Sindh into the court in Baghdad. They went to Baghdad and they trans- uh, translated some works like Sindh Hind and Arakant. If you look at these things, you'll find the translations of Indic works, Brahma's Putta Siddhanta and other such works. You find works like uh, Charaka Samhita. You find work of Shushrita Samhita. all these things were translated into arabic now the they the muslims at that time were part of the abbasid empire 700 current era abbasid empire stretched from sindh all the way through uh, baghdad and other such places northern africa where algeria is today and other such things all the way to spain southern spain they controlled a huge empire so islamic knowledge seeded this entire chain of countries up to southern spain in northern spain the christians in toledo they they in, in, in whole of western europe at that time there was a tradition that they would send their eldest sons to the moors the moors were the christians the uh, sons the most not the christians the muslims moors were the muslims so they would send their eldest born sons to the moors to learn at their feet because they had superior knowledge to them we we have from george fars writing the universal history of numbers he says how the byzantine kingdom used to persecute people who used indian numerals if you use wow. indian numerals you were set to use a work of the devil because wow. it was magic they were using the roman numerals yeah <laughs> if you used indian algebra and found answers to questions that are like magic how are you doing it you must <laughs> <laughs> so you have some evidence that there was persecution in western europe to use indic knowledge whereas the muslims were using it and the nobility of western europe used to send their sons over here to learn surreptitiously if you will all of this knowledge so there was a seeding wow. of this going on then finally when europe got its act together and they went and invaded southern spain they threw the moors out and uh, uh, ferdinand and uh, uh, isabella they they took over as uh, kings of spain king of spain they went through a period of inquisition inquisition was a period when they were stamping out any evidence of deviation from christianity whether they were the judaize the jews or the muslims they were stamping them out so that was a period of time when most of the <laughs> indic knowledge went underground most of that went underground because right. nobody would say that they're using indian knowledge or muslim knowledge because they'd be killed at the stake right so people were saying i invented this i invented that so you had this crazy spectacle of a euro coming out of the dark ages literally disease illiteracy <laughs> poverty and evidence that these people were under suppression operation of the church church did not allow any expression but you know what uh, all kind of crazy guys out of nowhere no ecosystem <laughs> but coming and saying I, i have invented this and that and that led to the so called renaissance which we hold up with no diligence at all we don't even ask where did you guys get these ideas from how could you build this huge cathedrals without any knowledge of mathematics it is a math- knowledge of mathematics that allows you to construct these huge cathedrals we cannot do simple calculations how can you build these huge domes and yep. uh, as in other such things nobody questions that <laughs> it just appears it just appears <laughs> yeah it is it is crazy i think it's 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 so interesting that there's there's not that sort of uh, it, it, inquisitiveness you know there there's so much inquisitiveness in the west towards like oh where did we we did this we did that and we created this and we created that but there's no but the inquisitiveness stops there it doesn't go anywhere beyond that okay we created this and we created that but where do we get some of the most fundamental building blocks for that true very true very true so 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 this 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 line of thinking like you rightly point out uh, there was an unquestioning acceptance i don't believe they embarked on a grand narrative then itself some of these things happened the way that some of these scholars hit their sources because of their fears i mean we know the travails that bruno went bruno was burnt at the stake for telling the universe is infinite he was burnt in the courtyard of vatican you go to today's vatican you can see there's a courtyard where the fellow was burnt galileo had to recant his whole uh, uh, theories 
Copernicus had to publish his works after he died and things of this nature. So all kinds of crazy things that we know. So the grand narrative of the West did not start right then. I believe it was later when colonial Europe came and they needed a reason for proclaiming the white man, you know, the divine manifest of the United States. And for us, things like the doctrine of lapse, all these bigoted ideas came about in a certain time frame when the Westerner, the white Westerner had to assert a moral superiority and the divine sanction for what they were doing, civilizing the savages, the world over, the white man's burden. So these narratives came about then, I think. But the yeah. strange thing is you find that when the colonialists first came to India, even the European traveler before the colonial period, they found that um, uh, it, the antiquity of India, for example, some of the early people like Bailey and uh, I cannot remember the names, so some of the French people who came and studied uh, Indian astronomy, they were astounded. By the way, the story, how did they even get in, interested in India? They got to learn about Vedanta from the translations of Aurangzeb's brother, Darashiko. Oh, Darashiko, wow. Darashiko translated 50 Upanishads yes. into wow. Persian. That Persian translation got translated into, Fra into French. That oh. was of the British, sorry, the Europeans, Western Europeans into Indian Vedanta. That sparked great knowledge. The Romantic era uh, when, uh, uh, when the dealings with India was always through very uh, lovely eyes. So looking at Indians in a nice way. The vegetarianism right. was being held up and about the, about the knowledge of India, the antiquity of India, all that changed after 1850. All that changed once the crown took over and uh, the narrative became one of, you know, there's an inferior race, knowledge came from outside. All knowledge came from outside. So that is the genesis of this wrong narrative that came. Till then, it was one of, there are so many British books that you can read in 1700s. It's available on Google Books, for example, that talk about how perhaps the Greek people got the knowledge from India. But after 1850, it has been the other way around. There was an yeah. entire period of time when British scholarship was such that the dominant way was, look at me, I took this Sanskrit text and I showed how it has got a later chronology, not an yeah. earlier. Yeah. So the, the entire intellectual uh, fervor, if you will, and the wave was towards showing that these works were recent works and not ancient works from 1850 onwards. So this kind of a narrative fits in over there, that Indian knowledge also came from outside it continues to the present day. Wow. It is tied deeply with the Western identity, too, which is very fiercely held by many countries and many peoples of the world. They will not let that go. So I think we as Indic scholars just need to push back against this with evidence and try to say, nah, the narrative just doesn't hold. I know, and uh, that's such a that's such a crazy thing as well. You know, you 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 look at some of these, you know, dead civilizations. You like you look at Egypt, you look at Greece, uh, you look at all these civilizations that are now dead and pose no intellectual let's say threat to uh you know sort of christian or islamic hegemony so these are civilizations that are looked at very fondly by western researchers they look at them very fondly they say oh look how nice look how fantastic they were they spend millions of dollars studying it and researching it finding out every last detail but for some reason, Indian civilization that for that you know uh, might even be more in antiquity and might have so much more to give and to offer, never gets that sort of treatment. And I always find it very very silly that uh, you know just because it might clash with your sort of uh, Christian worldview, doesn't mean that as as a scientist you can't study it or as a linguist you can't study it or spend the same amount of time and money that you spend on these dead civilizations you're absolutely right you're absolutely right this is a very strange phenomenon that when a civilization is a museum piece yes. you're more accepting of it rather than as a living civilization you know shambo i'm reminded of something many years ago i don't know maybe you're too young do you remember the larry king live show on cnn yes yes in the 90s yeah Okay, so I used to watch that in the 90s when I came as a student to this country. There was one particular show where he had a couple of tele-evangelists. I forget their names, but what they said struck me at the time. This tele-evangelist said the greatest threat to um, the theology of Christianity comes from Buddhism. Wow. That set me thinking, why would he say that? I had an inkling, inkling already because I had some knowledge about this, but I dug deeper. 
it turns out that so much of the parables of jesus for example as laid out in the gospel of luke in luke the book of luke were true copies of buddha's parables what buddha oh. said to his devotees all the stories in fact there is a, a japanese researcher i forget his name the japanese researcher who's got a book out there in google i can uh, give you that name later where he did a very bold thing on the left side of this book he puts the jesus parable on the right side the buddha's parable side by side <laughs> <laughs> page after page of the page 300 400 page book and he shows how they were just pure true copies so wow. the question was look a big liar or were they really the parables of jesus or did jesus plagiarize entirely from buddha or was buddha not a real person or were the buddha's parables copies which is where they going towards right now yeah. there is a bigoted narrative out there that says that the pali canon the lotus sutra all these kind of works were later writings because writing in pali or uh, prakrit did not exist so by the time they were written down he says they were already contaminated by christian ideas wow that's why thing that so there is no proof absolutely no proof of this just a wishful thinking projected scholarly into books and studied unquestioningly today because it fits with the grand narrative of the west the bigoted narrative that says that sanskrit is young indian civilization is young writing came from outside india you see how these are all tied i can talk to you about the edifice that you're up against this is the edifice you just take one little thing and shake it you got to go it's a tangled web you got to go and shake every little thing and break it so the researcher today unfortunately cannot be a very deep specialist because in a deep specialist they will attack you by saying you're saying this contrarian research but do you know that it's connected to this 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 and this so today unfortunately you have to be a generalist you need to go through the entire breadth of knowledge out there and then say yeah i understand the grand narrative that you have after but here is my grand narrative and because of this you see here are the places where your problems so why did i say all i said this because when you talked about museum pieces how civilization becoming a museum piece is no longer a threat this guy in salary king live says that buddhism is a threat and the reason for that like i pointed out to you this japanese scholar who talks about luke's book this guy jesus this guy are <laughs> true copies now buddha even the conservative scholar says find in bce and the uh, common people say jesus died 30 current era and so on so oh, what are you going to believe yeah exactly that's a crazy one so this this goes to the heart of the western civilization and i believe religion is a big part of it i have not talked about it in public but i've worked a lot on religion also on trying to see the roots of religion and my belief is that a lot of religious ideas also originated in the indic lands and our thought systems went to other places became corrupted and became part of other people's learnings so there are there are very strong reasons for my saying this scholarly reasons and not uh, jingoistic reasons at all and we can look for um, several people can google some of these things to go to google and uh, look up this uh, professor i talked about in japanese for example google for similarities between jesus teaching and the bhagavad gita for example there are several scholarly works that talk about uh, it is i you know i i find these uh, th- th- these arguments that people make sometimes these sort of more right wing um, hardcore christians make the argument when i hear them and they say oh uh, the basis of all uh, sort of morals in the world come from a judeo jude christian background and f- they they present that sentence in a way that it almost says that there were no morals or no teachings that existed before uh, the writing of the bible and that's that's such a silly thing because the smallest google search will completely disprove that theory that the uh, morals of the world are based on a jude christian foundation because the morals that are mentioned in the jude christian foundation all come from previous works and previous works of philosophy okay. so I've, i've i've always found that claim very fascinating and i've always found it strange that nobody actually comes out and says that man you're only 2000 years old you realize that there are works of philosophy thousands of years years before the bible was even compiled so that's an interesting one and i want to quickly take a couple of questions from people that have asked as well uh, just just uh, one or two questions before we move on to sort of the conclusion and uh, i want to take one from mas peters who donated on super chat so thank you very much for that mas really appreciate it he says uh, how do you find the history of 
origin of verbal usage of yuga for the for the concept of yuga for the very first time in history uh, is there is there some sort of an evidence where the concept of yuga was first discussed so uh, uh, i like like i said earlier i'm not an expert in uh, saying where exactly did it first enter into the record i know it is in the record in surya siddhanta i okay. know it got at aryabhata's time but is it there earlier but like i said there is ample evidence that in ramayana and in mahabharata there are evidences to the yuga when the ramayana happened when the mahabharata happened they happen in certain yugas they happen in certain yugas so there is evidence of uh, these thinkings over there i'm sure uh, a scholar might uh, give a comment sooner or later that says here is the first evidence of yuga somewhere but i don't have that evidence myself I see. And another question comes from Saurabh, which says, "What's a good starting point for Indian astronomy? Is it is it the Surya Siddhant, or uh, uh, I'm not sure if Saurabh is asking what's a good starting point for a reader to start. I'm I'm guessing that's what he's asking. Like, what's a good if somebody wants to learn about Indian astronomy, what's a good place to start? Yeah. So so here here's the problem. Here's the problem. There are there are books. There are many books, modern books, old books, and other things. But but the learning curve is going to be difficult because people assume then they're not writing for a beginner. They're writing for some other people who know the battleground already. Here here are some books. Uh, so I I would suggest that uh, start with Balagangadhar Tilak's Orion. It is oh. not an easy. It is not an easy book. It is a difficult book because Balagangadhar Tilak did not intend to write a tutorial. He wrote something contesting the Western narrative. Uh, so don't 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 look at his conclusion that Aryans came from Arctic. Lose lose that. But but you know in every book there are knowledge things that you take away. Sure, the knowledge sure. you take away is about Indian astronomy that he talks about about the data points he talks about. Use that, but uh, uh, carefully, judiciously use that. Second, I'd recommend books like uh, Subhash Kak's. the astronomical code of the rigveda for example outstanding book that's something that you might like to read look for works of dr p v vartak vartak there are available online so he has some excellent books scientific dating of mahabharata and ramayana again the important thing that you are doing there is you are reading the archeo astronomical artifacts that these gentlemen are recounting the dating itself you have to do diligence and when they embed it into narrative that's where you have to do further diligence and see where things are fourth i'd recommend the works of nilesh nilakanto he has written works on dating of ramayana mahabharata lot of archeo astronomical facts are given over there and so that will also help you in understanding nilesh's book are good in a in a second sense nilesh also gives a tutorial introduction in some of his uh, i recollect at least one of his book maybe the, the mahabharata he talks a little bit about some backgrounder that backgrounder might help a general reader to appreciate some of the concepts so um, uh, in terms of um, uh, a book that will start from the abc's of astronomy there isn't maybe i should write one <laughs> there you go there's an idea but but in terms of other books please listen to those suggestions balagangadhar tilak P. V. Vartak, uh, Subhash Kak, uh, Nilesh Nilakantok. These are four sources I have said. There are many, many more. I, my bookshelf. I have uh, several. I, I cannot recollect the recount the names immediately. But my suggestion is start with these four, and you'll eventually find a lot more to read about. Somebody also asked this question on my Facebook some time back, asking how do I learn about the night sky, which is a related mm. question. To learn about the night sky, I suggest a general person can get the Sky Map app. There's an app on your Android or your iPhone called uh, Sky Map. So if you calibrate your phone fairly well and you point it to a certain star in the sky, it'll tell you what that star is. Oh wow, that's amazing! I gotta try that out. Yeah, that's, a, that's a pretty neat one. It's a very nice one to learn about the night sky. So that's you might fantastic. download that too. Uh, Shri Nag Bharat is asking uh, the who who invented algebra and. what's the what's the evidence in india of of algebra because you know it came to al khwarizmi and al khwarizmi sort of uh, had the words which became you know algebra of today but the evidence points to it coming from india as well because a lot of work that al khwarizmi produced came from india so is there an evidence is there any explicit evidence of algebra in india? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So Al uh, Al Karazmi and other people, Al Kindi, Al Ghazali, all these guys got their knowledge from Brahmasputra Siddhanta. Brahmasputra Siddhanta that became Sindh Hind. 
and that is the source work for most of the knowledge systems so um, if if you look at what brahmagupta said he wrote down the rules for zero operation uh, rules for positive numbers and negative numbers which as you know is one of the fundamentals for algebra about uh, fund, uh, about these kind of things he did a lot of things uh, solving the so called pell's equation and other such things there's many many works that brahma uh, brahmagupta had did, had done even prior to that aryabhata aryabhata had got an algorithmic way of approaching problems solving what today we call the diophantine equation if you're an engineer or a mathematician you might recognize what i'm saying diophantine is a uh, greek and so this identity the diophantine identity which is used in control systems and uh, nonlinear systems is attributed to him but the reality is that it goes much beyond him it goes to aryabhata aryabhata had used the uh, methodology like that for solving integer systems of equations i don't know if, if the readers understand what i'm uh, listeners understand but you know algebraically you can express an equation in terms of integer coefficients and seek integer answers to these sets of equ- linear equations not normal linear equations the problem comes you either have an exact one answer if you have a square set you have five equations five unknowns if there is a solution you have an exact solution what happens if you got 10 variables and five equations only then you have an over determined set of uh, equations what happens if you have five variables and 10 equations to satisfy you have under determined over here yep so uh, there are various flavors of these equations and even today the 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 idea of solving integer sets of equations is very appealing for many of our modern mathematics technology and so on aryabhata had an algorithm for that and that algorithm is what has been called as a diophantine identity and uh, you might like to uh, read vidyasagar i don't know how many people even have heard of uh, vidyasagar who was the director of cair in bangalore the yes. artificial intelligence robotics uh, institute in bangalore read a preface of his book i have his book somewhere right it's not immediately available Uh, on control systems in his preface he talks about some of these things about how aryabhata should be credited with the word uh, diophantine or rather diophantine oh, wow. disused and in its stead we should use aryabhata so to answer your question long answer over there there's a lot of evidence of algebra available from indic works i quoted brahmagupta i quoted uh, aryabhata uh, because this is the period of siddhantic uh, um, um, Uh, astronomy that we have and we can talk about even prior to that we have but unfortunately we don't have uh, works that have survived thus far we have evidence of works that are there when you look at varaha mihira's commentaries and other such things we have evidence that works existed but those works itself have not survived so we don't yeah. know what have been i hope that answers your question Oh no, definitely. Uh, okay, let's take one last one, and this is from Akshit Thaplyal, who is asking: Does is Vedam Ji planning to give any lectures in India at some point? Yes, I have given several lectures every year. I go to India two times, once okay. in six months, and give talks in various cities. Last year, I gave thirteen talks in different cities. Uh, you can go to IHAR channel. There is I H A R IHAR channel on YouTube, and you'll find some of the talks. Not everything. Some of them are archived over there. or you can even search for my name on google and find some past talks over there this uh, october november i do plan to visit india and give uh, several talks in different cities oh, i hope perfect in new delhi as well as pune and bangalore oh fantastic so so coming to coming to to i say the a good way to i think conclude our conversation would be to talk about a good way that we can reclaim that learning and rediscover that learning that's something we were discussing i think before we went live as well that what can be some steps that as a people uh, as a civilization we can take to reclaim that kind of learning because you know we are often we often talk about uh, how how great the past was but to make sure or ensure that the future is great that way as well what can we do So 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 here we are we again need to talk a lot of history here it could uh, it could become a very big conversation I'll keep it short okay. so we connected we have been disconnected from our past forcibly disconnected from our past in the history in several stages but accelerated during the colonial period and now during the leftist rule of india it has become much 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 worse over the last 70 years the average indian has utterly and pervasively lost connection with that past there is perhaps very few people who can look with pride to their ancestors and connect to the works most of us are disconnected utterly disconnected 
So that said, how do you reclaim the, the space? That is the next question. So we have found, when I say we, my group, which is Indian History Awareness and Research, IHA, we have been working on uh, textbook reform. Both we worked in the Texas Education Agency in 2014-15. We've also worked in the state of Telangana for the last two, three years, and we are trying to work with other states also. We are re reviewing the textbooks, the material over there, and trying to offer suggestions. To me personally, I see how much things have changed since I myself was a schoolboy in Bangalore a little years ago. I remember, I remember so well how much of Indic content was there when I was a schoolboy. For example, when I studied lessons in Canada, many of the stories were Puranic stories. Many of them were oh. Purana. So we were still connected. In some way, we were connected. Now, fast forwarding so many years and reviewing the textbooks used by school children in India, I find the content is utterly gone, completely gone. So, it's a very whitewashed version. Absolutely. So revision after revision that has happened in, uh, in CRT has removed little by little, little by little, it's removed things out and put toxic content uh, pervasively inside. So today you find a very divisive narrative in the textbook. One that uses its inspiration on oppressor, oppressed. Who was the oppressor? Who was the oppressed? So they persist in developing feelings of hatred, feelings of isolation, feelings of disconnectedness. Rather than fostering unity in the nation, integration of the nation, and trying to build an Indic identity, connection with the past, all that is thrown out of the window. Rather, NCRT is now come with trying to have this oppressor oppressed that this guy, because of this so-called caste dynamics, this fellow's oppressed, this Aryans came in at this point, drove the Dravidian south, did all these atrocities, caste system, call that, this, sati, child marriage. You know, every single shibboleth has been pulled out with these guys to denigrate, to deride the Indic civilization. Mm -hmm. So we stand here, I are shocked when we see what the Indic student is learning today. When you groom students with something like this, when they come out, there'll be some of these raving lunatics that we see in the lawns of JNU going oh, down with the Indian Army, down with that, down with this. You wonder how that happened? Well, that happened because this is your uh, education system. You train people like this. What do you expect? There's no loyalty to the Indian nation. I sincerely hope some Indian education official listens to what I'm saying over here. This is our heartfelt uh, conclusion as, as scholars reading what is there in the content. We had, when we grew up, enough Indic material, not enough to the extent that we had in earlier times, as, for example, Dharampal has accounted and so on, but still sufficient to connect to our roots, sufficient to make an identity saying, this is who I am, this is who my ancestors were, this is how we lived. We had at least that connection, if not the glory of the civilization. Today, even that is gone. So we are at a horrible situation today where any PhD scholar, any teacher, any professor graduates from academic departments across the world and in India in social sciences that borrows this bigoted postmodernism and other such narratives and imposes it on the rest of us. There is no place where an Indic scholar can come with his knowledge systems, hold his ground, start a department, start studies and so on. I'm aware of some giants uh, today in contemporary India who are doing things, Rajiv Malhotra, for example, who are doing excellent things. I uh, hope that these things will grow much more in the future. Conferences like Waves, conferences like uh, uh, Swadeshi Indology, and these kind of things build up an uh, uh, ecosystem of scholars, scholars like my own colleague, Sahana Singh, who wrote a book recently on, uh, on the universities of ancient India. Uh, works that we are doing, the, the reviews that we are doing, and many others. We are not the only ones. There are thousands of people like us, isolated, who are doing uh, works in their own, brilliant works in their own way. We hope these small drops will become a tsunami in the future. But we don't see signs of that yet. We don't see signs. We have a very uh, Indic disposed government at the center for the last four years that does not appear to have done anything for the learning ecosystem of India. Nothing. How can, you, how can you possibly rationalize this? Is this ignorance? Is this uh, indifference? We don't know. So we what steps do you suggest in that matter? Do, do, you, do you think that there, uh, there needs to be a creation of certain kinds of pressure groups that can maybe create, have a, have a large number of participation and can create some pressure on the government? Let's say, you know, if you want to get elected, then this needs to be one of your election planks. 
Absolutely, you're absolutely right. You're abs there needs to be a lot of pressure groups and think tanks in the country. We have a situation that billionaires today are going and funding some classical library in Harvard. That, that, was, uh, in, that was incredible. The, do you remember the, uh, what was it, the Infosys guy that gave uh, Sheldon Pollock the responsibility yes. to do it? Right. That's right. Yes, yes. So people like that, billionaires today are opening chairs, like the Tamil chair in Harvard and other such things, rather than support Indic scholars in India who will try to connect to our narrators, because people cannot get past the chains put on their mind. They cannot break free. You need to unshackle yourself before you can go out there. That deconstruction needs to be done by people. That's not an easy journey, but people have to do that. So my, my, my hope is that uh, uh, the, the billionaires of our society, if you don't have a cause, this is the cause. If you care for what India was and what it can be in the future, support this, support think tanks, support think tanks, support institutions, support colleges that start these kind of things. Let's start our pressure groups in our own way and then start holding people accountable and uh, grow. Right now, that space is filled with enormous foreign money coming into institutions that we are well aware of, the church and the madrasas and other such things. These pressure groups are the ones that are exerting control on vote banks, exerting controls on institutions, exerting control on media and other places. That ecosystem needs to be challenged. That ecosystem needs to be confronted intellectually, and that needs to be turned. But that can only happen with money. That money needs to come in. So... I fervently wish that the Indian industrialist listens to this message and tries to fund Indic uh, groups. There are many groups out there. Do the diligence and support the correct groups and not the groups that are given uh, to this bicorded narrator. Definitely. And I, I would also say that, you know, if you look at the American system, if you look at the American sort of, say, right wing, uh, and, and you see that they, they have an ecosystem, they have recently developed a pretty strong ecosystem in response to the sort of leftist narrative as well. And in part, I think in a large part, that has come due to the fact that they have people that are willing to support them monetarily and financially so that these people are able to dedicate their time full time to doing this kind of work so to for this kind of a narrative to actually develop and for an ecosystem in opposition to that older ecosystem if that needs to develop then there needs to be some sort of a financial uh, input that people need to be start providing you know because in in hindi they say you know in north india they say bhuke bhajan na hoy gopala or which means basically that you can't you can't do this pro bono forever you can maybe you can try but it's going to make minimal impact if you want to make serious impact then it needs to be some serious investment into these things absolutely you're absolutely right uh, shambo i think uh, endorse it completely yeah definitely so i think i think that's a that's a very good way way to sort of conclude our conversation today as well and i i I, it was today was a very fantastic episode for me personally because I got to learn so much and I always enjoy episodes where I learn so much and I hope that the audience felt uh, in is similar in the way as well because I thought it was a very educational uh, podcast today. So again, I want to thank uh, Rajiv today for taking time out of your Sunday and and doing this with me. So I, I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much to also the listeners. Thank you, Shambhoji. It's been a pleasure to talk to you and to this audience. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you very much again, guys. Uh, make sure to go follow IHAR. Uh, I will provide the links in the description below as well. Go follow Raji, go follow his events and try to go listen to his talks if you can live as well at, uh, and attend them. I'll provide all the links in the description below. Make sure to go follow it. Let's try and create an ecosystem of these interconnected people and these interconnected the groups that can help create an uh, sort of opposing infrastructure as well. Again, thank you, uh, thank you guys for watching today. If you enjoy what we do here on the Sham Sharma Show, make sure to subscribe to the show's channel down below. I will see you guys for the next episode. And until then, stay happy, stay healthy, and I'll see you guys soon.